All right, good evening. We'd like to welcome you out to our planning commission for uh, January. We're waiting for Brad Tanner. He, he should be coming here shortly. Uh, but I uh, thought we'd at least get started with the three that we have. So um, we'll go ahead and start with a Pledge of Allegiance. And Mr. Davis, would you mind starting us forth? Will the audience please arise? Will the audience please repeat the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of, of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Our first item on the agenda is the meeting minutes from our October and November uh, meetings. I've had a chance to review those. Any questions or corrections? I've passed on a couple of comments already to Kim about the October. Uh, it shows me as being absent and yet calling the meeting to order and inviting the Cub Scout to take the pledge. Um, so if we can make those corrections. I don't know if that really matters. It's not that big of a deal, but otherwise I'm missing from the, the record. I think that was the night you ran the show. My name is Mr. Tanner. We've started. Uh -oh. <laughs> We're just reviewing the meeting minutes really quick for October and November. I don't have any other corrections other than that. So, anybody else have any? No comments. I'd entertain a motion with regards to the meeting minutes for October and November of 2017. Motion to approve those two items with uh, corrections made. I got a motion by Commissioner Davis. Do I have a second? I'll second. Second by Commissioner Tag. All in favor say aye. 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 Great, thank you. Our next item on the agenda is a preliminary plat for the reapproval of the Newport Village. Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This project is um, almost due west of us, about 10 blocks. It was originally approved back in 2016. First phase is essentially done, which is sort of this half of the project here. The applicant is getting to the point where they're ready to record a plat where the rest of the project with the second phase, kind of that northern half of everything. Their preliminary plat approval, however, has expired because of the amount of time that, that passed between when their last plat was recorded and now. So basically this, uh, I don't want to say it's a formality, this is an important step towards revesting the approval so that we can move forward and get the plat recorded. And with that, I would anticipate um, given how the, the project's been constructed, that we we could be issuing building permits within the next month in this phase. So, um, staff's still finishing our review of the plans to see if there's anything um, that uh, that the applicants still need to do. Anything that differs from the original approval, I think it's very unlikely that uh, we'll find anything. And suspect that uh, if the preliminary plat gets reapproved the uh, applicants will have a plat recorded here in the next couple of weeks and the project from one perspective will be done. Has there been any changes from the city standards wise in the in the same time frame that they need to be worried that we need to worry about? That's the exact thing that we're checking through now and uh, not that I'm aware of nothing that would impact what's been constructed or what what needs to be finished. Questions for staff? Anything on DRC or anything? Did that go through DRC or anything? What did they say? 
I uh, recommended that be re reapproved really without much discussion. But, okay, and there's no other conditions or anything that was on the. Correct. Okay. Do, do we, if, in terms of our recommendation, do we need to make a recommendation of approval based upon staff review, finalization of staff review? That's probably appropriate, yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. I think uh, if you were to, to make it conditioned upon the applicant addressing any comments they received from staff at this point, um, that's very appropriate. And not a public hearing, is that correct? Correct. Okay. So... Any questions, comments? How long ago was this date, a year? Originally occurred in 2016, they recorded their first plat. Kim, you probably have a better. The first December of 2016, and they have a year to record, and they didn't record by December 1st of this year, or of 2017. Hmm. Staff report you have in here is the, is the zone change and preliminary plat, but all we're doing is the preliminary plat. Is that correct? The original approval addressed both of the, the different requests at the same time. This is just a matter of reapproving the preliminary plat. The GO make a recommendation that we recommend to the City Council reapproval of the new Port Village preliminary uh, plat with the conditions from the staff. We got a motion by Commissioner Davis. Do I have a second? I'll second that. So second from Commissioner Tanner. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Item number three, conditional use permit for an alteration shop. Mr. Anderson. Do we normally have the attachments on here, but I don't see it on the board docs. I, I have things for We don't have much tonight, <laughs> certainly, for uh, this request. In fact, you'll, you'll hear me uh, talk in future meetings about the, the concept of, I can certainly speak up if that helps. Um, staff's recommending that the proposed conditional use be approved. Uh, I think it's a mistake that this, in fact, is a conditional use, uh, personal service business like this. So that would be something like, uh, a nail salon, um, it could be an attorney's office, I guess, uh, this type of a thing. You'll, you'll get a chance, sir, so hold on. Um, uh, I understand that in the past there were a number of different uses that were conditional uses in the city ordinance, and some of you that have been on the commission for a while know that we've slowly changed those, those different uses from being conditional to being permitted and I think uh, this is certainly something that we need to look at in the future. And the alteration shop, as I understand it, I think the applicant's here tonight so she can correct me if I get anything wrong, um, it likely wouldn't have more than one or two customers at a time in the shop. Generally, they, they're very quiet. They, as I just mentioned with the, the amount of customers that they might have, typically don't generate a lot of traffic um, or otherwise create the kinds of impacts that typically we try to address with a conditional use, uh, which is why, again, I, I don't necessarily feel like it should be a conditional use. However, it is. We have an applicant that would like to locate in this building, uh, 8th North and 1st East, basically. And um, the Development Review Committee reviewed this proposal and simply put, we recommend that it be approved without any conditions. And again, in the future, we'll, we'll do some cleanup work on the code, or at least we'll, we'll talk about that. And this would be one area where I think we can make some improvements. Can you define what an alteration shop is? So I know what, I just want to make sure we all understand that. Um, and again, I think it'd be good maybe to invite the applicant to, to get it right. But it's my understanding that it's, it's essentially a tailor working. So this is alterations to clothing and that type of thing, sewing activity not any particularly heavy machinery or that sort of a thing. Um, I've been in one or two of them, but haven't spent a lot of time in alteration or tailor kinds of shops, but 
That's my understanding. Basically, non non conforming for that area. Uh, no, it's a it's an allowed use in, that zone. in the commercial office zone, okay. but it is subject to having a conditional use approval. So that's why we're here tonight. That's why there's a public hearing. Um, but uh, it, uh, if approved, it's a conforming use, not a non-conforming use. Are, are there conditions outlined in the code that they have to meet? Sometimes there are, but not always. Uh, it's kind of an issue of semantics here a little bit. It's going to sound more technical than I want it to. If it were a use subject to conditions, those are the situations where we have premeditated specific conditions that have to be met in order for specific uses to be allowed in different zones in the city. This is not that. This is simply a conditional use, which means there are not any uh, predetermined conditions, and it's simply up to the Planning Commission with you acting as the Land Use Authority um, on conditional uses to determine if you feel like there's anything that's necessary to impose in order to mitigate any any uh, foreseeable adverse kind of impact that the use might have. So, what's uh, what are the, what are the other uses in the little development there currently? Are there others? There are. I think it's primarily professional office types of uses. Um, I know in the project. So it's, it's current zoning is commercial office? Uh, correct. Okay. And, and that this is a use that's approved within that zone and unless we feel like there's some conditions based on the use. Uh, what, what other kinds of uses are conditional uses within that zone? Sure. Does that answer your question, sir? Yeah, I'm on the board of that spy class. Uh, I'm one of the owners. Uh, so we are you know, we concerned about, you know, the different things going, going in there. We already have uh, problems with creative signs. They uh, bring in so many people with big trucks and high traffic area. They use up all the parking spots where they're so we, we have a big concern with this. Well, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll have the applicant come and kind of talk about her operations and, and that kind of stuff, so. So they just, for, for a zoning, for that area, commercial office, there's a, probably a list of 20 businesses that can go in there without question. Is that correct? 11, 11 so, types. And they wouldn't even have to come here, right? Correct, yep, we just issue a building permit. And anything that's license. outside of that, is kind of what we're talking about. And there are eight uses that are outside of that that <clears throat> potentially could be allowed in the zone with a conditional use approval. Okay. And to clarify the opportunity that we have as a city with conditional uses, it's not a matter of saying no to it as a conditional use. Again, they're allowed uses. Um, it's simply a matter of being able to impose specific conditions on the use. So that um, is really what we're here tonight to talk with you about and what uh, what uh, might make sense. Would it be helpful for me to touch on that even better? So on the screen you have the 11 uses that would happen, could happen regardless. So a, a vet clinic, a uh, nursing home could go there, medical dental lab, clinic, emergency care facilities and so forth. So, okay, there's something questioned. So number one under the subject to conditional use permit is an emergency medical care facility, but it's also under permitted use. That'd be something just to make I a don't note. Say anything for professional offices there. Number nine number is, nine is, nine is considered, yeah, it would be a professional office. Okay. Yep. So, so again, it looks like there's a little bit of overlap between the two. Even item number three, medical and dental clinics, is also in number six there. So, so where does this one fall 
professional service businesses there, retail stores number six, office supply stores, pharmacies with it when integrated into personal service. I'd like to invite the applicant if you don't come up and, and introduce yourself and tell us about your business operations and um, what you anticipate. Okay. I'm open again. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. So please, if you'll tell us your name. Yeah, my name is Sun Jung Jung from Salt Lake City. Great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's a traffic side, a little bit late. So. so we try to open the art duration shop for clothing. So this is uh, the conditional user permit area. So, um, so we uh, open the shop and then it's a not really heavy traffic, just uh, we, I, I think uh, maybe 15 to 20 a day the customers also they just drop and then pick it there. It's not really busy. So they're there for five, ten minutes yeah. at the most. Okay. Uh, also, their area is a uh, plenty of parking lot. So, in front of my shop, the building, it has a three, uh, f three or four car park, and then also other, the office or the parking lot is a lot. So, also, um, uh, I think it's a really good source. Uh, right now, city is. Uh, Growing and then it's a mall is across the street, but there's no art station shop. So I think it's a, I think it's a really convenient and a good source for community. How many employees do you have? Oh, right now it's a, just a start business. Uh, it's I don't know what's going on right now. So first I want to run by myself, uh, okay. and then later on I can see what's going on and then how many people come in and then I. Just uh, right now, I plan one or two, so later I can, yeah, hire. So how many do you think you could get? Eight, ten? <laughs> Hopefully, 20? a lot. But um, maybe. So you ask uh, how many? Employees? How many? How many are you thinking? Maybe you could hire. Hire. Uh, it's, uh, it's our tradition shop is not that much big, so I think uh, one or two. And that's it? Yeah, because uh, we, I just, uh, the people come in and then just to measure that one and then, yeah, alter the, their clothing. Okay. Do you have any other question? Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this is a public hearing, so I'd entertain a motion to enter into public hearing. So moved. Motion by Commissioner Davis, do I have a second? Second from Commissioner Tag. All in favor say aye. 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 Anybody here would like to come and address the commission, ask any questions about this proposal? Do we answer your questions? If you could come forth and could you come forward and state your name for us so we can get you uh, on the record? And I'm uh, Jay Partridge. I own one of the buildings there. I'm on the board of the, the whole complex. Okay. Uh, Now, on um, our alteration, I assume that says she's uh, doing alterations on a clothing or, uh, or making new clothing. That, that's the way she's described uh, it, yes. This don't seem like it's a high traffic situation, so I don't see any, any problem with it. Okay. Great. So. Thank you. Any other comments? So I'm a neighbor and I talked to about four other neighbors and um, no one's had any concerns. We've actually been really excited for this. So okay. what was your name again? Keisha Allred. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Any others? Okay. I'd entertain a motion to exit public hearing. Second. And a second. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions or other comments? Like a be a decent fit for the area. I don't see a real problem with traffic and it it's a it's a, a a use that's allowed by the zone as long as we approve it. 
if that makes sense. Yeah, okay. Yep. Um, how big is the suite, do you know, Dave? Just I don't, I'll stop in my head, although Clark can probably give us a... Okay, 32 by 30. So we really be required to have what four parking spaces for it, something like that. Yeah. There's about four per unit. Okay. Yep, that's about right. Four to five. Yep. Okay. Good. I'd entertain a motion. motion. You bet. Yeah. Make a motion that. Uh, uh, are we approving this, or does it have to go to the city council? No, we we approve it. Okay. I'd like to make a motion that we approve this conditional use permit uh, for the alternation shop. Okay, I've got a motion from Commissioner Tanner. Do I have a second? I'll second. A second from Commissioner Tag. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Welcome to Spanish Fork. <laughs> Our next uh, item on the agenda is item number four on the annexation policy. There's no change on this from what we discussed last month. Um, Mike, if we don't have a PDF, if you could just go to last month's agenda, in case there's anything that you want to discuss, I'll kind of rehearse the same things that I talked about in December, try to be a little bit more succinct. So Mr. Davis, I think, was the only one not here, right? So, okay. he's kind of an old pro, though, so I don't think he needs a lot of explanation. Emphasis on the word pro. <laughs> um, we're required by law to have an annexation policy. And in short, in two different ways, we, uh, we had a policy, have a policy now, I guess still, that's a little bit out of date. One of the, uh, the uh, conflicts with our current general plan and different things like that, um, I know as the, the Trojan explosive plant or Ensign Bickford, that land was in Spanish Fork for a number of years and therefore was included in our annexation policy plan. Seven or eight years ago, we did a boundary adjustment with Mapleton and that land, everything on the, the east side of the state highway over there was transferred into Mapleton. We never changed our annexation policy plan to reflect that. So that's one change. Another needed change has to do with the uh, construction of Woodland Hills Drive. So if you can picture this is how I, I would picture it, how that road comes to our main street on the south end of town. Even better. Our anticipated city boundary used to follow, in essence, a canal that runs right through here. And with the road now being constructed, we think it makes a lot more sense to have our city boundary in the future match the road rather than that. Um, so that's another change that's proposed on the uh, new annexation policy plan map. And that's really all there is to it. So from my perspective, it's a pretty straightforward cleanup. The process that we have to go through as a municipality to adopt a new annexation policy plan is spelled out in state law. And we followed that process now by providing notice to a number of different agencies and entities that are expressly listed in the state law by holding a public meeting, which we did with you in December, and by holding a public hearing tonight and then a public hearing with the city council on the 16th. The proposal will be ripe or ready for the city council to act on adopting the new policy plan if that's what they choose to do. A whole lot for very little real effect in the world, but we do make an effort, usually more of an effort than we have in the commercial office zone to keep some things straight. <laughs> um, that's always embarrassing, but and that's really what we're trying to do here is just uh, keep things as accurate as we can. Is there any change in the language of the annexation policy? There is. It's quite a bit uh, more succinct than it used to be. Um, and I think, uh, I think it's very appropriate with the, the version that's before you now in terms of the level of detail. 
I think we have a much better understanding today than we had back when the original plan was adopted by the city, I think in 2001. So it's been 15 or 16 years since it was, uh, was uh, first adopted. And incidentally, since it was last updated as well, um, much of the verbiage in the, the current plan has to do with infrastructure needs and different things like that, that you know, many of the areas that that plan was describing in terms of needed infrastructure have since been annexed and developed. So, Do we have a map that shows the boundary as we're going to approve or look at approving or recommending, I guess? I have a hard copy, and otherwise I can describe it. In fact, if you want to go to the general plan, um, yeah, if you turn that on and then pan out, So any of the areas that are in color here, um, are included in the annexation policy. And have since 2001. Um, the, that's a good way to look at it. This proposal would scale back the annexation policy by removing the Ensign Bickford property over here. And we'd make the addition of what I believe is three or four acres of land right there. Those are the changes. Okay. Any other questions for staff? Where this is a public hearing, I'd entertain a motion to move into public hearing. So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Tag. Second. Second from Commissioner Davis. All in favor say aye. 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 Is there anybody here that would like to address the commission relating to the proposed changes to the annexation policy? Hearing only crickets, we'll entertain a motion to move out of public hearing. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Davis. And a second from? Second. From Mr. Tanner, thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? Uh, if not, I don't see any concerns that I have, so I'd entertain a motion regarding the recommendation to the City Council. Motion to recommend City Council annexation, the new annexation policy. Commissioner Davis gave us a motion Sorry. and a second from Commissioner Tanner. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you so much. Um, that concludes the items that we have on our Planning Commission agenda for tonight. Uh, we have a work session planned to go over to go over a couple of items. Um, so, Do we keep this recording or? Uh, it's your choice. Um, I, I'd probably go ahead and adjourn. Okay, I, I do what she, I do what she says. Okay, do we need to make a motion to adjourn to work, work session? Or you could say we're adjourned. We're adjourned. There we go. That works. I'm I'm easy. I look to Jason. He can tell me whether I'm wrong or not. So we get way off base. He'll yep. rein us in. That's good. Happy New Year. Um, Thank you. Likewise. In light of that, I'd uh, like to go over a couple of different things, not necessarily in any particular order, but uh, you know that occasionally we try to touch base with the commission to make sure that we have a feel for what you think is important for us to be working on relative to, to projects that might impact development or land use or regulations, any of the things that come before you. And it's been a while since we did that, so I'd like to take some time to talk through um, some projects to get your thoughts and ideas. I'd also follow up with uh, Commissioners Wilkinson and Euler, maybe just via email, get their thoughts, and touch base with you guys again in February. Um, that's a very helpful tool for us to have as staff. A lot of times the, the, uh, the agendas for work sessions and things like that come directly from that priority list uh, that we get from you. So. There's that that we'd love to touch on. And then also, we've had several discussions in development review committee meetings in the last few months about different projects and the potential value that the city might enjoy from having some standards that we don't have in place today. 
we don't uh, have much of a track record in Spanish Fork of regulating design or architecture or different things like that. And I don't expect that our appetite for getting really involved in how projects look and that sort of thing is gonna, gonna completely change overnight. But we ha have reviewed a few proposals that have been something of a concern for city staff in terms of uh, just how they, they look and how their looks might impact uh, neighboring properties, neighboring businesses, and that sort of a thing. And that's led to us wanting to talk with you about the idea of developing some regulations for design. In this case, talking, I think, specifically about building design, maybe some regulations that would, uh, would go farther to dictate how landscaping looks than what we have today, and perhaps regulations that might uh, even impact land use in a few different ways. I'm just going to give you the, the real examples that, that we've kind of struggled with. Um, Main Street is a lot of things for Spanish Fork. Um, it's a gateway at several different points to the community. Um, it's an arterial class road, a big road. It's intended in every way to carry a lot of traffic. Um, it's a corridor for commerce. And particularly on the north end of the city, um, it's a corridor that provides access to industrial kinds of, of uh, uses. And we've, we've had a couple of different applicants visit with us about doing projects north of I-15, so North Main, where they have proposed to just simply build a steel building. And in each case, they propose to build the steel building as close to Main Street as what would be allowed. And when I say a steel building, I'm not trying to be derogatory or anything, but try to paint an accurate picture uh, without any embellishment or anything, just simply uh, a steel structure, um, which has led to the Development Review Committee to, to simply ask, is that really what we want um, along our, our Main Street? Or should we require uh, different things in terms of maybe how buildings are designed, uh, what materials are used in constructing buildings, and some of those sorts of things. Uh, we've also talked about uses, and for example, whether it's appropriate to have, um, and I'll use the example that we've used, although this hasn't been, been proposed, if somebody wanted to do um, a boneyard or a, a salvage yard for a company's equipment and that sort of a thing right next to Main Street. Today we'd re we would require that that kind of a use at least be screened from Main Street with a masonry wall, but at the same time uh, we simply ask is that is that the type of thing that we would want to have on our Main Street frontage, um, whether it's screened from view or not. So. Uh, that's specifically what I was referring to when I mentioned the kind of the question of land use and what uh, may or may not be appropriate. Uh, regulations that, that provide um, some specific stipulations for how buildings look and how they're designed and that sort of a thing are very, very common to find in communities all over the place, uh, including along the Wasatch Front. Uh, again, We've got a history of trying to avoid getting involved into that kind of regulation. Um, and I guess that's maybe where I would start with the commission is, what are your thoughts on, on having some requirements for uh, buildings? Um, I don't really wanna get completely into the weeds tonight, but rather maybe to get some direction from you on, on whether you think that's worth pursuing. Um, if you think that's worth pursuing, uh, what's an appropriate scope for uh, some kind of design standards? In the DRC meeting, we simply talked about, uh, about Main Street, but since then, several of us on staff have talked about the idea of, you know, we really have more than one you know, sort of entrance to the city at different locations around the community, and the idea that, you know, maybe we should uh, look at this kind of a project as more of a gateway 
kind of a, an, an approach and provide some design standards for you know, maybe some other high profile kinds of locations, uh, not just our main street corridor. So again, uh, just kind of general thoughts. And if again, this is something that you think is worth pursuing, uh, I'd love to talk about sort of the scope. Uh, and if we get some direction to move forward, what we likely will do as staff then is um, do some pretty quick and simple research to see what other communities have put together, try to maybe provide a palette of different things for you guys to look at and consider as, as options and different approaches to take moving forward um, with the idea that uh, if, we, if we decide to do this, um, it's something we'd like to start and finish in a matter of months you know, rather than to take a year on it. So anyway, does that all make sense? Do you have questions about? Well, you know how I feel, especially with that North Point printing. I think, I, I, don't, I don't mind metal buildings in an industrial area. Uh, they're great buildings. Uh, my concern is that we have a good front on them, a, a good, you know, veneer on them. Uh, I think also we need to have a cushion between our sidewalks and our building too, along Main Street, you know, with, with landscaping and stuff like that. Um, I think we need to design that and no matter where it is, whether it's in an, in an industrial area or in a business area, I just think we have to have the look. I, I don't like a straight metal building. Uh, I, you know, I want some type of a landscaping and some type of rock work or, you know, that type of work that we talked about in that. But I also think we need to have a cushion, a landscaping cushion between our sidewalks and our buildings. You know, I was over up on Ninth East in Provo doing a little project a couple of weeks ago and noticed one of the one of the apartment complexes. Man, it came right off the sidewalk. Didn't have any design to it at all. You know, and all the other buildings around it was just beautiful and had cushions, even though they were five and ten feet. But this one came right off, and it was just a sore thumb to Provo. We don't want that here in Spanish Fork. I mean, here we are developing some wonderful areas in that industrial park, and we can also make it into businesses. Why goof it up right now? Let's, let's, let's fix it right now as we go so we don't have that because they're going to fill in people want we they want it right now on the airport same same type of deal i just think you got to have some type of a cushion between sidewalks and your building and a fine veneer on your buildings i really do we need to put that in our standards so we're not conditioning everything okay you can zoom in on that area of town <clears throat> Maybe from the this off the freeway to yeah, that's terrible. Man, that's terrible. There's some landscaping there. Actually. Yeah, that's a lot. Of I'm not sure I ever noticed. I'm not sure I ever noticed that there was landscaping there. So, and, and yet you can go down the street, one way or the other, and it's the the apartment complex. See that? That's nice. You know, they've done a good job. It's got some. It's got some designs, and it's broke up a little bit instead of just straight up. Well, anyway, that's good. That's bad. I agree with you there. If someone rides a bike down the path and drives me, that's just to be on a sidewalk right next to the road. I'm always afraid the cars connect. Ever been to Chicago? Good heck. It's terrible. God, I feel like I'm, I'm going to have buildings fall in on me. You know, we don't want that. I mean, let's, let's have some openness yeah. in our. In and our and today we do, we require setbacks and we require park strips. Um, what kind of setback is there on the, in that part of town? Uh, it, it would range from 20 to 25 feet typically, and that's measured from the property line. So typically you would have the curb, okay. and this might vary a little bit, but 8 to 10 feet of park strip before you have a sidewalk or a trail. Okay. And then from that outside edge of the sidewalk or the trail, that is the edge that's closest to the building, you'd have another 20 feet of setback, at least, that's landscaped and that sort of a thing. Um, well, there's I, some, I mean, uh, 
First of all, I, I agree it's time for something down there because you've got a lot of piecemeal of non-conforming to what you just said. Like the, the old, uh, on 1600 North, where I think it's turned community now, it used to be the credit union. Yeah. That doesn't have that kind of setback. Not even close. Not even yeah. close. Uh, and there's a lot of examples, probably even Hickory Kist, where Hickory Kist restaurant was. That wouldn't have that kind of setback. Probably doesn't, yeah. And so I think it's, it's definitely time. And I was going to just say on that, on that map of that area, not only Main Street, but maybe even, and, and I don't know, I, I suspect what you're talking about, Dave, is, is, is something that would be, have a certain depth of those properties that would, that would be in this rules or this development plan. It wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily go you know, the full depth, right? So are you, are you suggesting that, so let's use that piece of property just because it's long, long okay. away, you know, maybe that's the right depth to say in that yeah. depth that way that, you know, on both sides, but that's you need to have way. those particular requirements, but you could then put up a yeah. standard metal building, however you want it to look, as long as it was screened or hidden. As right, as so as you drive down the road, you can, it's got a nice curb appeal, but you could even do that same rule as you go down these main roads, you know, so you'd have that same deal. Does that make sense? So like right here on this long stretch right here, you might have s some real attractive buildings that might fit this new design you're going with, but behind those, away from street view, could be the more, you know, conventional warehouse or manufacturing that you would see in an industrial park, because that's what this is, it's an industrial zone. Right. Right? Uh -huh. I mean, you can have anything down there. You got cabinet shops. And, and we're not necessarily really anxious to change that either. Right. You're but but you're, you're wanting to give a, a, a curb appeal from, here's this gateway, freeway off-ramp. Uh, if I go right or left, I still see an attractive city. Right? That's well said, yeah. So, I, I, you know, I think you could, and I suspect you're talking about going all the way down to the Springville, Spanish Fork well, it's, border. It's maybe kind of interesting. It's more the, the projects that have been a concern to us are actually further to the north. Yeah. yeah, up there rather than closer to I-15. So certainly, yeah. you know, that whole corridor, and as reminded, I had forgotten about this, but we've actually adopted design standards for the airport. They're not, they're not uh, terribly specific, um, but the main reason that we did that was a concern about how the airport would look from Main Street when we eventually get airport development happening across from, it uh, used to be Long Longview Fiber, yeah. Um, yeah. Capstone, yeah, um, where there's you know, a few thousand feet of frontage that the airport has, yeah. and just trying to make sure that that area develops in a way that that adds something to that corridor rather than to be a detraction. Um, so, you know, the idea maybe then. Focusing on, and Richard talked about, I think, how things look from Main Street. So maybe almost three-sided kind of architecture even. You would not necessarily care about the back of house, but just really how things look from Main Street. Main Street, maybe some of the cross streets and that kind of a thing. That might be one way to make it a little bit easier for people to, to invest where we want the investment made. Uh, from an aesthetic perspective on Main Street, maybe worry less about the backside. Yeah. Um, yeah, here's an example of that at DRC. Is this particular location, storage units, basement yeah. wall, meandering sidewalk, and landscaping? And you can give us some dimensions on that too, but right there. another thing that, that I wanted to talk about relative to landscaping is that. Uh, for example, today, you can meet our landscape requirements by just putting rock every place where you see grass there and add a few shrubs and a few trees, and that, that meets our requirements. So from my perspective, you know, in terms of the area that's dedicated to landscaping, I really don't think the spatial relationship necessarily is as important as making people do things that look nice in the area that, that we want them to work with. 
Um, so I'm not necessarily going to suggest that we increase setbacks or do anything like that. Although, if you want to go that direction, we certainly can. But I do think doing things like you know having maybe some berms and having you know, different uh, treatments constructed, the landscaping materials and that sort of a thing to make them a little bit more interesting from from a visual perspective. Uh, that's much more effective in in certain applications than just having a lot more space. I agree. I hate people tell me, gee, Springville looks really good. Spanish Fort doesn't have anything. You know, I, let's keep our standards the way they are. I also agree that we need to have sidewalks on both sides of the road. Um, I think the airport needs its own zoning in the future. As, as, as it grows, yeah. its own beast, it's, it's um, as we look at, at that future stuff, since Spanish Fork's now going to be the sole, sole owner of it. Now it is, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, I think landscaping is a big key through our main street for sure, and any other little industrial area. I think there are <coughs> some looks to it. Well, in, it, I'll certainly give credit where credit's due. I think Springville has absolutely gotten some things right. Um, I, I hear from businesses that complain about a lot of things that Springville imposes along their fourth north corridor there, you know, Walmart, Smith's, and so forth. We used to call it the Golden Mile. I remember if they had beautiful new overpasses and that interchange built. Um, but their landscaping requirements have really led to some pretty attractive yeah, and, uh, development. They, they've, they've looked forward to it, you know, and and planned to the future. And Spanish Fork's been that all along. We just, we have got a few bumps along Main Street. We just goofed up a little bit. And that's not much we can do about that, but we can to improve of what we got. So when you talk about gateway standards, are you just thinking of the industrial area, or are you thinking about the other main thoroughfares that we have into Spanish Fork, such as the Benjamin exit area coming up to the Main Street, Southern Main Street, Highway 6, like, do we have standards in those areas, or they're just zoned differently, so we're not worrying about them? I just wondering, when you said gateway standards, are we thinking all gateway standards or just this area? We've wondered if it makes sense to look at things other than just the north end of Main Street. I think it does make sense to do that um, for a variety of reasons. I think we would want to start on the north end of Main Street to come up with some things. Bruce and I talked earlier in the week about how maybe to to approach this project in increments that make it so that we could get some regulations in place relatively quickly um, and start to see some good happen that way. But uh, we've got. US 6 in the mouth of the canyon. There's not a ton of development potential out there um, for the kinds of development that I think typically these standards would would uh, would address. But we've talked about that. I think that's something that, that's worth exploring. Um, we've got State Road 51, the old Springville Highway, that today I don't think we consider necessarily being uh, you know, one of the main entry points into Spanish Fork. That's going to change a little bit, I think, uh, particularly when Spanish Fork Parkway makes the connection over the railroad tracks, ties into the existing part that's built, and... Spanish Fork Parkway, the same thing. And that will definitely be um, a corridor. I think we'll see that flanked with non-residential development on, on both sides. Um, so I think that's, that's another area to, to think about. And on the south end, you know, South Main, um, I think it's difficult to appreciate how much better South Main Street looks now than it did before UDOT did the widening, for example, before we had a couple of, of development projects done, you know, something as simple as a, as a convenience store and a car wash and some different things like that. Um, that area has changed for the better in a lot of ways, and I think it's just starting to happen uh, there and the Salem Benjamin Interchange. Um, in my mind, that, that's, that's part of a project that really 
deserve some very particular attention, um, that could be another Canyon Creek, and I think should be. And, and communication with, with Salem, coordination, I think, needs to happen there. Which, that's kind of funny, but uh, Mail Brailsford from Salem, I think uh, he's probably finishing his last minutes as the mayor right now, but for years he's pushed us to adopt some standards with Salem that would be identical you know, in each city. Uh, and he has, I think, very sound motivation in wanting to see that happen. Um, and I think Salem would be entirely agreeable to, to that, that kind of an approach. So I see a few different ways to approach a project like this. Again, from my perspective, it's that north end of, of Main Street that probably is the, the most pressing need. I'm not trying to put words in anybody's mouth, but I'm not hearing anybody say don't, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll throw in my two cents just because you and I talked just but uh, so that others know. But I, I see the first step is kind of defining our zones of, of where we're talking about. The north industrial area could be the first zone. Then there's a gateway zones. There's historic Main Street zone. There's Main Street commercial zone. And there's what I just wrote down as rodeo town. Uh, zone, you know, down by the, the the arena and the and the rodeo town. I thought, well, maybe that's something new. I can we can start working through. Um, so define those zones and then prioritize those zones on, you know, work projects that says, okay, we're going to start with the north industrial, then we're going to go to the rodeo zones, then we're going to go to the gateway zones, and then I think the other Benjamin exit, other other projects could build off of kind of the concepts that are developed uh, through that process. Um, I, d I do want to encourage that we, in this process, avoid styles. Uh, I don't think it's our place to define whether it's a, a you know, Tuscan design or a um, French villa or whatever, you know, whatever design styles. I, I have worked in cities where I could choose from four or five different styles. So it can be Tuscan or it can be Craftsman or it can be, you know, so the, the, I think we want to avoid that. Um, but I think, you know, bulk and, and mass and, and those kind of general concepts are good. Materials, I think, is a good conversation to have because um, I'm, I'm certain most people don't want to see an all-glass box. I mean, we talk about a yeah. metal building. Right. It's really no different than an all-glass box, you know. Um, well, stucco, I, right? I mean, or, yeah, just... one big stucco box, yeah. Um, my question I have, uh, if one question is enforcement and review. Do you en envision the Planning Commission reviewing adherence to these standards? Is it a staff review? Some cities have... I mean, Santa Quin City has an architectural review committee that review that. Provo City has an architectural review committee. Um, you know, I, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on on that. I, there, there's value, and and as an architect, there's also it's a pain in the rear uh, to deal with that side of it. So, uh, and I'd certainly like to get your thoughts about that. The easiest standards to come up with are ones that are kind of broad and it's subject to the approval of some review board. Uh, so going back three or four weeks ago when we first started talking about this, that's kind of what I thought might be best is just come up with some broad parameters and give, you know, this the planning commission or some separate board some uh, ability to, to maybe dictate some things that need to happen on particular projects and we call it good and just go to work from that perspective. Um, that's easy on the front end, a lot harder over time to administer. It's a lot harder to be consistent with that kind of approach. Um, so I think the best approach would be come up with some, some hard and fast rules and put those into play and not leave it up to any particular board uh, make it as uh, as objective as we can, take the subjectivity out of it as best as we can. Uh, so maybe it's just a matter of our building official pulling out the design standards, measuring them up to to a set of plans, and going from there. Uh, I agree. That's I hate design building anything. 
you know, if it's in if it's in our standards, the applicants come in and they know what they've got to do. It makes it so much simpler and so much righter. Instead of us sitting here design, building everything before they get it up. I just add to that. I mean, I think sometimes there's value in sort of taking baby steps as well. And for me, that might be the the equivalent of a baby step. And again, some some rules that, that would impact the things that we're the most concerned about, but make the process of getting a project approved still as as easy as it can be. I think in the in the requirements, uh, you know, and when you when you were stating this is what we expect for a submittal, you know, the easy way is to say. I'm just going to use so another another city that I've worked in required a certain percentage of windows all along Main Street, which I think is appropriate. I think that's a good thing. Like a, a Main Street historic downtown kind of a. Um, the, the, yeah, I mean certainly that was where it applied as well. Where I'm at now, yeah, where that project is didn't wasn't in their historic section, just along Main Street. Uh, but to be able to say okay. Here's the standard, and what we want you to do is, you know, submit a table that says, you know, percentage, and this is how you calculate it. Because I mean, that, that is such a pain as an architect to try and go, okay, where am I calculating this? You know, is the is the wall is the square footage of the wall up to the up to the uh, top plate, or is it up to the eave, or is it up, you know, what, <coughs> what what is that area? So some of that kind of clearly defining how we want to calculate or how we want to evaluate that would be helpful for not only design professionals, but I think for staff as well to be able to say, okay, yep, check, they've got that. Yeah. Everybody likes predictability. They want to know that if I do X, I'm going to get approved. Staff likes that. Um, people get mad when they're surprised and when their expectations aren't met. You know, those are two things that seem to generate uh, some friction occasionally with different people that we work with. So anytime we can, we can avoid surprising people, we'd like to do that. The other thing that I think is that's hard about this, and again, I'm going to use that same window uh, description, is the use of the space can change that. And I'll, the example I'll use, if, if you're walking down Main Street and it's a retail shop, it's totally appropriate to have large expanses of glass. But the project I worked on had, it was a medical office building and we had exam rooms. And I don't know about you, but I don't know that I want myself, you know, in a large exam room with huge expanses of glass showing my wares to, the, to everybody on Main Street. Uh, and yet the, the standard was the same, whether it was a you know, medical office, whether it was a medical office or whether it was a, a retail space. So I, I don't know how, the, how you work that component into it either. Yeah, and yeah, talking about style, I don't think we necessarily, and I, just to agree maybe, we don't have a role in dictating what style somebody chooses to follow, but being somewhat genuine to some kind of an approach to design, I think makes sense and when, when seen this more than a few times cities for example require windows in certain places where you just can't put them and you know, then you get the fake windows I can't remember what those are even called yeah um, it's something that over time it it loses its luster it doesn't wear well doesn't look well um, because it's not genuine you know it's not real it's faux um, we also need to be conscious that we don't establish standards that don't cost these owners a substantial amount of money and again I'll use an ex same same building example here but um, I think the the city's intent and desire is to have a two-story bulk and yet they still allow a one-story building but the building has to be 25 feet tall and so here we have you know and, and we have pretty tall ceilings in this particular unit it's 14 foot ceilings but we still have 10 feet of parapet Wow that we have to provide to meet their standard of a 25 foot minimum. So again, there's some unintended consequences that we have to be careful of, I think, as we review uh, this process, so. Again, as a starting point, I think we'd, we'd try to catalog some examples of different approaches that other communities have taken. 
Bruce really is an invaluable asset as I see it on this kind of a thing because he deals with it yeah. every day. So I'd uh, love to pick his brain as often as he'll let us. Um, your next meeting is scheduled for the first week in February. We do have a, a work session with the city council next week. Um, but if it's uh, okay with you guys, I'd like to, to bring this up with them. This is one of the things that we anticipate working on here in the next several months. In the hope, honestly, of getting some buy-in there with them, kind of get their blessing and you know, just take it and run with it. Okay. I'd like to mention, just as a, as a, in that same area, this will be just future planning. You and I have talked a little bit about the lack of east-west roads from Main Street East. So if you go down there a little bit further, if you go from 1600 North, the next east-west corridor is clear down to, is it 2400? 27. 27. So there's not a, another road from 1600 to 27. Wow. Now the railroad and a lot of those existing buildings are gonna limit what you can do, Dave. But I think some good planning to do something the city can do now to secure at least one more road uh, east-west will take some pressure off. You know, 1600 North is is bad right now. And where are you guys at? I can't. The, the, the new lighted intersection is 1600, and there's just there's getting to be a lot of uh, businesses out there that that goes out to the the dealership. There's new storage buildings uh, all along here. And so this gets a lot of pressure on it at 1600. And then you got clear down here for the other one. So as this develops, it's just gonna put a lot of pressure on those two corridors. And I don't know where you could, where you could even put one, but I, I, w I would challenge you to, to to work on that. I have a comment that might fix that. I think a lot of the traffic gets impeded with people are trying to take um, right turns into businesses and right turns into streets. And I think they all, most of them are going to need their own right turn. Um, Come on up and talk. <laughs> okay. Um, I think, I think uh, a lot of uh, traffic gets stuck as people are trying to turn right into businesses or onto other streets. And I think if there were, um, if they had their own turn lanes um, going right, that it would help a lot with traffic and, and uh, the flow of it. So, and, and if there's like, if there's some space between the lanes and the sidewalk and the grass spot before the, the sidewalk or whatever, that's going to give you some space in case you actually do have to add another lane to that road someday in the future. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've talked with our engineering department about updating our transportation master plan and that that potentially is a 2018 project. The question that you raised is one of the things that we'd ask. Typically, we hire, we hire a consultant to review things. And that's one of the things that we'd ask them to, to focus on. How can we get one or maybe even two additional connections between those two roads? And honestly, I feel just as strongly about making a connection in that area that actually could work, which might have the effect of making 1600 North Main worse. But if we could connect the east side of I-15 to the west side of I-15, um, that would limit the need for people to take a very circuitous route to get, for example, from Canyon Creek over to the city shops and things like that, which right now it's down through some heavily congested intersections, 10th North, Main Street, back up, or vice versa. Um, Are you talking about that underneath that bridge where we went on that field trip that day? That's our best chance to do something. That's right. Yeah, there it's it? called Williams Lane there, yeah. Yes. It's not very wide, though. It's not very wide, but it works. And it would work better if it were asphalted and, and that sort of a thing. And you know, again, relative to, to 
to 1600 North. Yeah, if even worse without it would something. today, unless you had some other connections too. So I mean, I, you're absolutely right. We have and probably on even down here on the west, the west side. You know, there's. I think you've got future one right there, don't you? We do, and uh, at 1400 North as well, um, <clears throat> just north of the. Down, down one more road down there. Oh, right there. Yeah. Yeah. So that'll that'll help support right. growth and businesses without congestion. But that's right. that area east of Main Street. It's. Yeah, it's challenging. It's the concept of why why the center part, the old part of our town, works pretty well from a grid. connectivity, the yeah. grid system. Um, you were just you were just down in San Diego, and when the ballpark got built down there, one of their big concerns was traffic and congestion. But it works mostly because of that grid system that gives people 27 different options to, to get out of there. So. Okay, cool. Design standards, let's just call that project. What else? What have we had on the list that we haven't gotten to in the, from the past? Yeah, I went back and, and looked at it, <laughs> and I think we're better off to start from scratch. There are a number of things that we have addressed over the years, and I probably could dig that up still if you'd like. Um, Sometimes it's helpful. <laughs> we have a couple of things that are already upon us, River Bottoms um, vision project we're calling for now, name likely will change. That's something that different capacities you guys are going to be maybe heavily involved in. Um, anything else come to mind? Any zoning kinds of issues? Uh, any, any pet peeve sorts of things that you see in developments that you'd like to see us review? Um, any things about the community, for example, Kevin? He did some research on his own with our GAS guys, just relative to wanting to understand more about how we're growing. Um, how many permits do we issue for single family homes versus town homes and that kind of a thing? Um, stuff that I think is really interesting, it's certainly good to know. Uh, and we certainly could leave this fairly open ended tonight as well. Those thoughts come to mind. Shoot us an email collectively. We can, we can kind of construct some things that way. One of the things that's been coming to my mind from time to time is the comment. I think is it Tyler Cope? Is that who used to be on the planning commission and talked about the Reese apartments? He came to that who when he, he came about that. But he he made the comment. He says we've we've done a pretty good job of planning for one component of the growth in our city, but not particularly density. Um, and, and so I think that's a conversation that I think is worth having. Um, again, it's that, it's that age old balancing act, right? That we've talked about between wanting to maintain and be this cute little quaint city that we love, um, but also recognizing that Salt Lake County or Spanish Fork, or Utah County, excuse me, should be the size of Salt Lake County in the next 50 years. So where is that gonna happen? And, and I'm sorry, uh, we, we can't just turn our back on it and say it's can't it's not going to happen here. I just don't I think I don't think that's a realistic thing. We have to do it smartly. Um, so I think that's part of that conversation. The opening of the Reese School, you know what we talked about from first east to whatever third east and from first west to third west, rezoning and and making that a higher density type of area from like 8th North to Center Street, you know, that type of deal. Have a public hearing on something like that and talk about it. And coming off of Main Street, you know, that would that would open areas for parking and things like that for, for businesses off of Main Street and things like that too, along that first east, maybe even close up some of those roads. And anyway, just some so what you're saying is look at the general plan and maybe think about adding areas for higher density. On them areas, you know. That's a tough one, but it's easy to see the need for that. That, that becomes if you're gonna, tough. If you're going to start jumping up a high density, that would probably be where you start, especially if you're going to give it to the Reese School area and start to go that way. 
I can see developers buying those smaller homes through that area and building an area like the Reese School is going to get through those areas. Anything happened on that Reese? Yeah, the yeah, applicant is uh, getting ready to move forward. They've submitted some things, not necessarily everything. They need to move forward. Site plan as well. Okay. So we'll be reviewing that. I don't know when you'll see it. But. One thing I'd be interested, how long has it been since we did the CPAT project? Be has it been three years? Three years in May. I, I just think it'd be an opportunity to revisit that and kind of kind of review what the recommendations were and kind of see where where we are in that process and you know I, I just don't want that to get shelved and collect dust uh, I think there was some pretty valuable stuff there and I know there's things have happened as a result of it um, but just be curious to know what I'd be interested in knowing I know we've mentioned this before but I can't remember that we've ever had a lengthy discussion about this the planning for parks and recreation and things with the city growing like it is just even in the current amount of homes that are being built and everything what are what's our parks and rec department doing to prepare for that kind yeah. of growth? we last did a parks and recreation master plan in 2008 it's time 10 years is a long time mm -hmm. or something like that to go without being updated um, I thought when we had the work session, geez, what, maybe two years ago, where Dale Robinson came and talked about plans for parks and that sort of a thing, that was good for me to hear. Yeah. I felt like that was helpful for you guys. Is that something we have, uh, are the master plans incorporated by reference into the general plan? Is that how that's technically done or should it be more ingrained in the general plan? Yeah, ideally everything would be bound in one volume, all of the different, I'd call them elements of the general plan, transportation, stormwater, you know, et cetera, you know, dealing with all of the different services that the city provides and land use, um, all chapters of one document for a variety of reasons, things just haven't evolved that way for us here, so they're very they're very individual, each of the different elements of the general plan. In most cases, it's a different consultant that's prepared their own individual documents, so there's not a lot of cross-referencing that happens. They're adopted the same way. Um, do we, does the Planning Commission review those? I, don't, I can't remember. Yeah, and typically, there's not a lot to talk about. We hold public hearings, but for the, you know, wastewater, element of the general plan or drinking water, you know, some of those kinds of things. We're going to rely on those experts. Right. Um, now, land use, that's a totally different animal relative to, to how you're involved in that sort of a thing. Um, the, uh, the discussion that we had with, with Dale, though, and just kind of training, we did a few things this past year, not quite as many as I, I would like to have done. We had the folks that came in from SOMAS that talked about residential design a little bit. Um, had a guy talk a little bit about commercial development and a handful of other discussions with people. Um, how about that? Is that is that worth Yeah, I think it's worth it. Trying to keep Okay. Yeah. If there are ever any particular topics that you want us to, to hit on, it's not hard to find pretty qualified experts to that are willing to give couple hours of time to, to come and we'll spend some time. Uh, Anything new on the uh, development? Uh, kind of a, you know, down the river bottoms. Uh, we got approved for what the, the annexation was. Yeah. We get the family that was doing that. They put them at the... Oh, is that Warner? The Warners or the Bradfords? Yeah. 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 
I just met with their engineer yesterday. They didn't necessarily have a plan, but wanted to talk a little bit about the process going forward and that sort of a thing. They'd like to be under construction spring. Mm -hmm. It's going to be late spring at this point. And I, yeah, and maybe ambitious too. Um, but yes, they're they're getting ready to move forward. We we're working. We've got a grant to construct a trail from the river up to the fairgrounds, and their development kind of ties to, to that a little bit. So yeah, we've had a handful yeah. of conversations about that. I'm always a little bit surprised though that you know things are go 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 go. And then you get to a, an approval point, um, and oftentimes it takes applicants, you know, developers, weeks and months and months and months and months yeah. to kind of get to that next step, and that's that's where they've been. So, yeah. How about Canyon Creek? Anything exciting now that we've got the movie theater open and Olive Garden, right? Those are the, <laughs> yeah. the coup de gras for in 2017, right? Panda Express under construction. Um, I, I haven't noticed yet. Have you noticed another building under construction in front of Walmart? It kind of on the north side there. If that hasn't happened yet, that will soon. That'll have a restaurant and some other retail strip space in it. Um, Hospital going to break ground this year? You know, they need to start to move if they are. Back in October, we had, uh, I'd call it a, a pretty significant meeting with their designers, engineer, traffic engineer, and those kind of folks. Um, the ball's in their court on getting plans ready to submit for us to review and approve. Um, I will say that going back to 2010, maybe 2009 even, um, when we first started talking about IHC, kind of ending up with the property that they have now and building there, they've always said, as we wrap up the project in Provo, we plan to just roll right into developing a facility in Spanish Fork. And they predicted that that'd be around 2018, so they could open a facility in Spanish Fork around 2020. And it seems like they're gonna be pretty close to that mark, but uh, they've got a lot of work to do before they can start building. Four stories, yeah. River Tim. I think it will be very similar to that, yeah. But other, other than, I just want to mention on Canyon Creek, uh, we haven't really heard a lot. There's the phase that's just north of the TJ Maxx kind of building um, that'll sort of mirror the, the building that those businesses are in. Um, there's room for another pretty good sized box just north of Walmart, immediately adjacent to Walmart, and some other out parcel kind of development like what I mentioned. Um, Ross will open next month, which uh, fortunately is a couple of months later than we, we wanted to see, but that'll help. And we're going uh, like what, Kmart? Is it something to go in there? Or it's not going to come down, is it? Sure hope so. But I, I'm losing hope yeah. that it's going to come down and be replaced by something. For whatever it's worth, I just talked to a broker today that thinks they have a tenant lined up for <coughs> So it's kind of bittersweet. Again, from my perspective, just given ceiling height and some different things like that, the building in its current form we know isn't suitable for the kinds of tenants that we really would like to see take that space. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, getting somebody in there, getting lights on and some activity and that sort of thing definitely is a good thing. Yeah. So that might happen sooner than later. The Walgreens building, might see something happen there as well. Again, for whatever that's worth. I, you know, the city's doing, I think, a pretty good job of keeping up with the traffic in that area, it's a it's a challenge, but they're putting in different islands to direct you. And you know, I see and hear a lot of people complain about those. I haven't heard anybody say that they feel like the city's doing a good job. No, I I do. I I think they're trying to keep up. 
I mean, that's hard. It's impossible. Really I mean, hard. it is what it is. The volume is what it is, and it's only going to get. But I think some of the things they're doing are the right things. <coughs> it, it's just hard to adjust. People yeah. are hard to adjust. I can't go left no more. I got to go right. Right. And but you can see why they're doing it. Yeah. Really, if you look at the big picture, it's to keep traffic moving. That's it. That's exactly it. Make it as good as you can. Just wait until IHC opens. And What's the word with Hugh Dot on 2600 North? I, I had a long conversation with Shane Marshall last couple of weeks. He doesn't have a lot of insight necessarily into the project, but we talked about that. And um, the other folks that we talked to at UDOT, they understand that uh, this spring a consultant's going to be hired to start work on the environmental impact statement, which is the first step to being able to design and interchange and uh, fund its construction. That's probably a three-year project. That's how long it took. Actually, I think in Maple, or sorry, in Payson, it took four on a project that just wrapped up last fall, doing an EIS for their main street interchange or and maybe replacement. Just the review and preparation of the EIS is a three-year project. Might be able to speed it up a little bit, but not a lot. So yeah, backing, backing out from there, you know, almost even if it were a design build and you had funding ready to go, as soon as the EIS is complete, you're, you're six or seven years out before anybody's gonna drive on, on that. And that's probably more optimistic than we should be, yeah, ambitious. Um, but it's moving forward, getting, I think we, it's $1 million in one budget year, $2 million in the next budget year, something like that, something on the order of $3 million uh, were provided by the, the legislature, I think, in the last session to make that happen. And that's, that's the starting point from my perspective. That's really critical because that three-year project, like I said, you can't speed that up. So you've you got to get that it. started ASAP, get that out of the way. Then you have lots of different options about how you can move forward. But um, Any other questions or queries? Anything else from you, Mr. Anderson? Just real quick, so design standards, river bottoms, we'll be talking more about river bottoms, I think, next month as well. Maybe general plan, looking at places for higher density. Um, maybe some er the, excuse me, areas or some of the, the neighborhoods that kind of flank Main Street, CPAT review. <coughs> I'll go back and brush off my list of <coughs> topics for training. Um, see if any of those are particularly interesting for you guys and just kind of this conversation we'll work on doing some kind of a development update maybe more regular than we've done in the past and like i said i'll i'll reach out to, to mr wilkinson and mr euler and see if they have anything they want to add and if anything comes to mind for you guys likewise yeah, i think it's good to have kind of a living list that there's some ebb and flow to it and i'll talk with the city council about that next next week as well that's it for me. Thanks. And that uh, we will adjourn our meeting for January. See you next month. civil engineering we're in I'm in a, con a conundrum a conundrum can't even talk um, the I2 zoning I think you put it up the table before it talks about setbacks in the I2 zoning it's 50 feet all the way around except for self storage the Planning Commission you guys have the ability to reduce setbacks up to 10 feet. Well, as I'm trying to lay out a 
that's a big difference in what the setbacks are. And so I, I researched a little trying to understand why it could go from 50 to 10. And usually the industrial is placed on your collector, either minor collector, collector or arterial class roadways, which is appropriate. And the road cross section has a required six foot tall masonry fence at your right of way line. Well, then if you, so you have the fence and then your building's 50 feet back from that. Well, typically storage sheds, they are constructed uh, to where the rear wall of the storage shed acts as that perimeter, that perimeter fence. So in essence, if the storage shed was built to 10 feet from the right of way line, you're actually moving that six foot masonry fence 10 feet further into the property, you know, creating another 10 foot landscape buffer to create that barrier. Um, at the direction of my clients, I had presented a site plan to DRC that showed it at the 10, because of course, if you say 10, I draw it to 10. Uh, they didn't like it. I'll be honest with you. They, they said, well, we, the, the table says 50 and we won't let you out of DRC until it's 50 to come to planning commission to ask for somewhere in between 50 and 10. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, I had, I had prepared, um, this was, the, this was the plan, I made a couple of copies. This was the plan that we presented to the DRC. That, that is the one that, yes, that shows the 10 foot uh, setback. Based on the, the bearings of the roads, it varies from 10 to 13 off of Del Monte and 10 to 14 off of, of Arrowhead. Uh, the DRC felt that it was... Uh, it, where it's at. Yeah. Right there in the corner. That's it. Zone industrial two. Yeah, I two zoning with either residential zoning adjacent to it or residential uses around it, so that the uh, that invokes the fifty foot setback, except for where the C two the commercial across the street. So it's set back on all four sides or just the road sides? All four sides. Based on the table, it's, it's all 50. And so you can see on the, uh, on the two non-road sides, we have proposed to build a perimeter fence and then have interior landscaping, interior drives before you hit that 50 foot setback on buildings J and then all along that north side, that's a, that's a 50 foot setback. Um, we could accomplish the same thing along Del Monte and Arrowhead of we build the six foot perimeter fence or the six foot masonry fence at the right of way line have 15 to 20 feet of landscaping interior and our access drive to where we build the 50 foot road. I don't know if that accomplishes what your previous discussion was on gateway or entrance. Uh, that just gives you similar to what you have on Arrowhead as you move to the north uh, against that residential subdivision. Where you just have the masonry wall. Is that the table? That's the table, yep. Perfect. So I guess my request tonight is is more of just a what are your thoughts on is the reduction what are the rules for the reduction? What, is it, what sort of reduction would you like to see? Is it 
25 feet of we don't want the right-of-way fence we want 20 feet of landscaping uh, we want 15 feet of landscaping those are those are sort of my questions and those were the <coughs> questions we discussed with DRC this is a really unique scenario you guys understand that right because it kind of even ties into the conversation we had earlier about subjectivity and that sort of thing this is as subjective as it possibly could be if you as the planning commission see some reason to reduce the setback you can but you're not obligated to at all and i think it, it's kind of interesting how this came about it was this property and a previous project that now i can't remember if it actually got approved it's a work session that's right <laughs> <laughs> i was hoping we said adjourn Nice the, uh, the other proposal that we saw, this he, re he really wanted to hang around tonight. Eight so. or nine years ago. So um, we, we talked about this when across the street, we end up keeping a little commercial spot for that. For Instead of that, giving that residential development, all residential, right? Yeah, right. We talked about this, because at the end, what, why did this ever become industrial? It's just sitting there. There was an itself. asphalt batch plant there, yeah, I think. Um, it never there. got changed. It's yep, there was valley asphalt. Zoning stays essentially until somebody asks to have it changed. Is this the appropriate zone for this location? I think we wouldn't. It's, that's not how we have a general plan. For yeah. example, you have a pretty high dollar neighborhood here. <sighs> Same over here. Mm -hmm. The public hearing that we had on the first proposal, I'll just say, was really surprising and really ugly. It was what was the surprising part? I didn't expect that many people to show up. No, no joke. I'm not trying to to, to make it sound that was DRC's worse. Concern. Yeah, I so we're that, yeah. we're a little bit sensitive to that. Now, at the same time, this is zoned I two. Yeah, we're talking about storage units, which it's a conditional use, but again, allowed. Um, we, we would be under the same obligation as we were to the alteration shop. We have okay. to say yes. Right. It's a matter of figuring out what the conditions to mitigate that impact, right? Right. And the question on the, the setback, and again, I just have to say this, um, it was proposed and ended up getting adopted so that a previous proposal could have the buildings just 10 feet away from that property line. That's where they wanted to go. Um, that's totally trivial, but... Um, the other thing is, is what's underneath the ground here on all this area. I mean, what's the, anybody done a geotech study on any of this? I mean, yeah, yeah. Yes. have you? Yeah, there's some uh, work that has to be done, but yes, we have. And given the property's history, you know, honestly, storage units probably are a fairly appropriate use, I think. And if you had any concerns about you know, what might have been left behind from a previous use, Talking about <clears throat> structures that it almost entirely aren't inhabited. Um, so, uh, the 10 or 50 or something in between question, I think, is just a matter of has an applicant employed measures that justify a redu reduction from the 50 feet? Uh, Mr. Berg's right, the DRC did not feel good about reducing the setback or recommending that the setback be reduced. Um, I'll throw out maybe one other thing for consideration. If we were talking about single family homes, and we're not, we're talking about buildings with a lot more bulk size to them. But uh, for example, the single family homes that abut Arrowhead over here, they're set back 25 feet from that rear property line. And in that case there, we have a solid wall right on the right-of-way line now we'll never do that again we've learned that's not the kind of streetscape that we want but um what would it be done different on that what there'd be say? landscaping and the trail and an additional landscaping between the trail and the wall yeah, um, and right now if i were to propose a 
parking your parking landscape buffer off the right of way is 15. For if we create actually this, if this was the goal commercial. commercial. You're right. Yeah. So from the right of way line I'd have 15 feet of landscaping, then I would have a parking lot, and then I would have a commercial type building that, that would meet your 50 foot setback. I think in the DRC it was perceived that if we hold to the 50 feet of setback, that meant 50 feet of landscaping. I, I haven't quite uh, come to terms that that is a truth. You know, we would probably design portions of the project differently to maximize that space, whether it's parking or other interior roads that would meet the building setback at 50 feet, but not site planning, access drives, parking. It's not, it's not 50 feet of landscape. I think that, that, that's really the DRC question is how much landscaping do we want to see on those, on Arrowhead and Del Monte? So this is, an, a, per, this is a permitted use, not a conditional use. Sorry, this is a conditional use. So what kind of conditions can we enforce on that then? How much landscaping they have, how landscaping looks. Okay. Lighting, hours of operation. Um, well, I'm just going to say that because of the area that that's in with the housing and everything that's around it, I think 50 feet is reasonable because I don't think that's fair to those landowners to do that to them. But that's just my opinion. Uh, I kind of touched on this earlier. Um, is there any value in talking about what's in the landscaped area? Uh, versus maybe just focusing on how much landscape area there is. I'm not, I'm not trying to argue one way or another, it's going to sound like I am. So, I mean, what it looks like instead of worrying how much distance so it is. Maybe instead of having 50 feet, it's 25, but you've got more trees, you've got things that are more interesting, you've got stuff that's going to create more of a screen for the building wall than, you know, you might otherwise have. And those kinds of things. I, mean, I, I think it would be worth a, a site visit for this because there, I think there's some specific conditions that would impact, I think, how we approach this because the grade differential from Del Monte Road to these properties is pretty significant. It drops down quite a bit. So the impact of this on, on these residences is really, in my mind, how they drive by it, not necessarily how they live it. Does that make sense? Because I think there's quite there's enough of a grade differential. I mean, I don't know what it is, 40, 50 feet. Uh, I mean, it's uh, something like that. Probably Clark and Thompson and the first two houses in as it dives down. Right. It, that's but the those are the first two. Yeah. yeah. By the time you get to Lowers, you know, it's yeah. they're they're down at the bottom. Yeah. So I, I you know so I, I I think the way I would see it is trying to figure out a, a an appropriate street streetscape through here recognizing that there's already quite a bit of drop and change there um, and maybe that 25 feet, I don't know what the num magic number is. Right. Um, so. Can, can I touch on another thing too, just while we're at it? The, the design of the building itself with the wall, in my mind, that's another another way to justify a lesser setback if it's not just one well, let me that, continuous. Let me say the picture you showed us earlier with that landscape and that wall, you know, I'm talking about the elevations of base of the development. Yes, I have that too. Um, so this is what they propose to construct as the kind of caretaker, caretakers residence, is that right? Office. Yes. This would be on Del Monte, kind of uh, northeast end of the project. Um, and then CMU, masonry wall, Kind of hard to get much of a feel for what that that might look like. Um, That's your each one. So was the 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 meeting that was I think you said ugly. 
was it because of this because of what the use was going to be used specifically yeah yeah which was what storage 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 same storage same storage use it wasn't the setback wasn't on their mind it was with the use how can the city consider approving this <laughs> yeah houses yeah well I I personally think it ties totally in with what we've been talking about tonight is the gateway that is a gateway road either leaving the city or coming into the city and and I the the type of use because it is zoned what it is zoned and and what was going on there before maybe them things could justify this but it would be all about what it looked like from the street to me. So the trees, the berms, the grass, the trail, I think, you know, some time spent on what that could look like would would be the only thing that, 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 that could that's sell. That's not going to sell it. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know? I'll no. say not. Yeah. No, it would have to look very, very nice. Pull up down Monty. Pull up down Monty Road. And, and, and the, school, well, the school. Grass, and the school. Grass, trees, berms. Corner. Uh, trails winding you know just <clears throat> something that didn't make it look like the typical story and it's a, it's in a nice neighborhood you've got you know you got schools down the road the, the MATC and uh, charter schools I guess like the sense I get from listening to our conversation is that we probably won't go to 10 feet, but we probably won't require 50. Is that <laughs> so? We're going to be somewhere in between, and and I think somewhere in that 20 to 25 range. I, I'm guessing. I'm, I'm trying to pull out. I heard 50. Sorry. Well, I guess that's true. Yeah. I'm just sure about thank, that. thank you for reminding me of we'll that. We'll see. Yep. I got a question. Um, you don't need to come up. It's all good. Well, He's flash the sign yeah, that's, can, you, yep. can you bring up the floor plan again? The, the site plan. Yeah. I got 45 screens here. Yeah. There we go. Okay, can I borrow some of these pointers? <laughs> There's one right there on the... On the. Right there. All right. So, is this... Oh, okay. Is this, like, just a grassy area right there? So that yes. you get the 50 feet. So I'm, and then this is your wall, right? Yep. Yes. So I'm thinking this looks, this is kind of ridiculous <laughs> um, for a storage unit area because if I were going to storage unit, I wanted, I would want to be able to turn around, like turn around a truck in there, and having grass in there. I always thought grass kind of looks ridiculous at a storage unit because there's a storage unit and grass is maintenance. <laughs> but um, 
but I mean I can understand like a 50 or 40 foot or whatever on the outside edges of it and you want to have a nice sidewalk and whatever so people can walk past just fine and get around town. Um, and uh, yeah, so I guess I guess my suggestion would be just have the space for grass, have or you know a tiny bit of grass or or whatever landscape between the sidewalk and the road. And then the other thing I would say is if if these guys are worried about this being here in the first place, then maybe they need their own turn lane into there so that it's not blocking traffic as people are trying to turn in. Not that they're going to have tons of traffic coming in, but um, it's a thought. Um, so yeah, so just a little turn lane into it. And then, yeah, I don't know, but this grass just seems ridiculous to me. <laughs> so I would, I mean, if it were up to me, I'm not, I'm not you guys, but I would just say, you know, big enough for a truck to turn around in here, but you know, need landscaping. Thank you. You have a comment, um, question? I just had a comment. If I wasn't at the meeting where it sounded like all oh, you know what broke loose, but why don't you let the people who were really angry about it in the first place help design it so they are happy with the landscape and let them um, decide, not necessarily decide, but give them input so they feel like they have a voice when maybe they didn't feel like they had a voice before? I mean, if they want to put the trees, That'll make them happy, and it'll make them happy, and everyone's happy, or at least happier, but let them decide. I would want to decide if I lived there, if I was going to look at that for the next 15 or 20 years, what it's going to look like. At least say I had an input in it and picked out the trees and whatever. And that doesn't seem too hard, but it makes them feel needed and wanted. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? They can look good from the outside, dressed up. I know there's one down in St. George on uh, Dixie Dixie Drive that's got Swiss. Swiss. Yeah, yeah that's good looking. It's a nice Big old palm trees, and yeah. and it's got we nice get palm trees here. Is that what you're saying? Can we get palm trees here. <laughs> well, uh, a brother down in that subdivision, several friends down there that I've talked to about this. It's kind of an interesting piece of property for what. This happened over the years. Mm -hmm. I think one time it was a, I, you, you might know a, a kind of hole. Uh, they dumped, you know, concrete, different things in. Um, we certainly want it to look nice, very nice. And, you know, we think it's a, a low traffic uh, a thing, a nice, uh, you know, kind of, it's kind of on, you know, those homes kind of fall down into both sides um, where it's really not a you know, nice one. We certainly wouldn't want it to be. We, we really have an intent to, to uh, really build a nice unit there. Have it look nice and would be very, very clean. So, you know, I I don't know what happened in that last one, but we we certainly you know would do our part to get down in there with some of those people as well and. It must be more than six years ago because I wasn't on the planning commission. I don't know who was on it. Who owned it? Anymore. Uh, Jed Morley was the applicant. They, they owned it for a number of years. They they might still own it. Same thing. We bought it. We bought oh, really? it. Yeah, they don't own it. Yeah. Um, again, just to be clear, it's not a matter of the city improving its work because there are some exactly what you said. Um, if they meet all of our standards, same they issue of that property no behind Blake. I guess the one is house where they'd have to come in, take all that out, do geotech studies, do the basements. Right now there's a, there's development. Let's see if I can find my button here. There's there's already development along this boundary, but there's not along that boundary. Is that correct? No, that's uh, the Calumet half. That is a Cali arc. Yes. Okay. It's, it's one of those things where, you know, I think you want to be sensitive of that one. You want to be sensitive of that one. And, you know, probably the three sides, that one is not as important just because... There's nobody there to really care at this point. So, to, so with the, the comments you made about the grass, right on that part oh, of the just property, there's actually a high end down there. Show them the so they've got some easements, and so we, we designed our stormwater retention over there. 
It seems so out of place for about these things. Uh, yeah. And from what I understand, they're going to be putting up. Yeah. Kind of I don't know what else you're going to build in there. It'll kind of maintain you know, some landscaping and, and some nice facade homes. So there's a practical reason for the yeah. for the grassy area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Was that helpful? Maybe. I guess this is your warning that something is coming. <laughs> <laughs> the storm is coming. No, yes. just kidding. No. Uh, yes, it's it's helpful that uh, we will come with a plan that shows the buildings meet the 50 foot setback. You can have some elevation views and some color and yeah. colored landscape plans color. would be we'll really helpful. Landscape plan. That's, that's going to be your best sell to the neighbors or yep. anybody else that's going to look right. good. And maybe if you had a couple of options too and you wanted to keep it kind of loose, you know, I could you know, honestly I could see you know, the way that they could design it where you would like it a lot less with a 50-foot building setback than with a 25-foot, maybe, let's say, building setback, yeah. just because of how different things are arranged. Yeah. Um, and I appreciate that because we're not hearing all the data or anything like that, but, you know, that's, I guess, maybe why I feel like exploring some options what? might be. What's the zoning further up here? It's rural residential and right immediately. And then where we've got the MATC, MATC in the school, what kind of setbacks do those guys have? Uh, this is park, I don't know right off the top of my head, but it's industrial too right next to that. That still is undeveloped. Okay. Um, that other I2 to the north. I think it's general plan, mixed use. It, yeah, probably. The business park has a 25 foot setback. I, mean, I, th I think if you started there, you know, not be any closer than 25, something I would entertain. Al along Del Monte at least, and then maybe it's a bigger one along the gateway that we've been talking about tonight, so. Any, anything on trails or anything going along there? There's a trail. There's a 10 of the trail master plan for Barrowhead Bay. Is that a meandering trail or is that, I mean, it's not meandering. you've stopped meandering. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you all. Good luck. Thank you. All right. And with that, we will adjourn.